Now we have a real change agent coming to talk to us. Uh, this is a gentleman, uh, Dr. Frank uh, Chung, who has done so much at so many different levels. And so he worked in state government uh, as an assistant to uh, Assembly Speaker Willie Brown, the dominant legislative fi figure for decades, uh, on all sorts of policy areas. And among the things that he did was bringing youth organizations, organizations focusing on youth together so that they could leverage their combined efforts and energy. And so that's a remarkable thing if that's all he did, but it's not. He's been president of several colleges uh, here in Northern California, and he had to interrupt that uh, because uh, this guy named uh, Barack Obama appointed him to work as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Education focusing on community colleges. And community colleges are tremendous change agents, and that's what you're about to hear about uh, in addition to a lot more about the uh, American higher educational system. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Frank Chong. Good morning, everybody. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be here. And uh, when Paul Cheng called me, uh, we, uh, I met Paul when he was principal of Lowell High School, and I was on the school board. And I hadn't heard from him in a long time. And he called me and said, hey, Frank, uh, how you doing? And he says, well, can you, uh, I have this program called the 1990 Institute I'd like you to speak at. And uh, he said, can you cover uh, uh, the US educational system in 30 minutes? And I said, well, who's the audience? I could probably BS some people, but he said, they're high school teachers and middle school teachers. And I said, you know, that's kind of like binge watch uh, down Nabby in one night. You know, you just can't do it. Uh, so uh, I'll do my best, but uh, I think uh, these presentations are just amazing. I think about uh, my own upbringing uh, in, uh, in, the, in the United States as an American-born Chinese. Uh, living in uh, New York City, people ask, often ask me, well, how do you define yourself? When I uh, look at my own upbringing, uh, and uh, I grew up in New York Chinatown, so people say, well, who are you? And I say, well, I'm an ABC from NYC, you know? <laughs> I'm an American-born Chinese from New York City, and that's from a, a play that Charlie Chin, a great uh, musical playwright, Chinese-American playwright, did many years ago. Uh, so I looked up some postcards from my era uh, so greetings from Chinatown, New York, where I was this weekend, and it was just a great place to grow up. So, you know, growing up, one of the things Chinese kids did was go to Chinese school. We would go to Chinese language school after American school, right? So I would be there, and I, you know, I couldn't play with football or basketball with my uh, uh, Italian and, and African American classmates. So that's why I didn't end up being the next Jeremy Lin, even though I wanted to be. Uh, <laughs> but if you look at that flag, it's the Republic of China, it's Taiwan. And that's the Chinese Consolidated uh, Business Association building on Mott Street, where I uh, labored in Chinese school uh, until my uh, mom finally uh, uh, let me out. Uh, but the, that was during the 60s. So here I was in Chinatown. And my understanding of China was a picture of Chiang Kai-shek in every classroom and uh, Taiwan, right? And then the 60s roll around. And all of a sudden, uh, Nixon and, uh, goes to China. And you, all you know this, right, the little red book. and uh, uh, Mao Zedong uh, all of a sudden becomes a part of my uh, thinking. Uh, and then, of course, as the 60s progress, you see the same pictures as interesting in some of the uh, things that are going on in China. In New York Chinatown, uh, many of my contemporaries and friends were part of uh, the civil rights movement. And that's often a story that's not told, is, the, uh, is a story and activism that went on uh, amongst the Asian American community, uh, both in New York City and also, in, of course, in San Francisco State in the creation of the Third World Colleges. I was an Asian American Studies major at UC Berkeley. So rather than studying China, I studied the, the, the experience of Asian Americans in the United States. Uh, and so here's a picture of me with my uncle in the, in the 60s. And I'm also a product of New York City schools. Uh, I attended PS1, that's how old I am. Uh, PS 126, Junior High School 65, and Brooklyn Tech High School. Uh, so I'm a product of uh, public uh, schools. And I'm also a parent of two daughters, uh, Sophia on the right 
and me on the left uh, who attended San Francisco Unified School District. And how many of you are San Francisco Unified School District teachers? All right, well you can take credit for these uh, beautiful young ladies because uh, uh, Mia is now a, a, the one on the left is a, an apprentice at the Oberlin Dance Collective. I'm a proud daddy and she'll be performing tonight so I might have to leave a little early. And the one on the right is Sophia. She graduated from University of San Francisco in education and she wanted to be a teacher and she did a, a an internship at one of the public schools and then she went to work for a startup. Uh, she decided uh, the uh, experience of being a teacher was just not uh, gonna do it for her and now she's just starting this week a, a job in a cannabis uh, uh, dispensary that's opening up on Lombard Street. Uh, so yeah, you go figure, right? Uh, and I also served on the school board for a term uh, during the, the 1990s uh, and this is a picture of me and Sophia at my swearing in. So I set from a kind of unique perspective of being a child of public schools, uh, a parent of school children who went to public schools, and also as someone who uh, had the honor and privilege of serving uh, on a school board, uh, which is, I think, one of the most thankless, thankless jobs in, in, in the world. Uh, and now, you know, I also served currently as president of Santa Rosa Junior College. Uh, and how, where are the teachers from uh, Windsor High School here? Uh, All right. Uh, Windsor High School is a uh, in Sonoma, County, did you go to JC? See, she you turned out all right. Yeah. <laughs> so Santa Rosa Junior College is gonna be celebrating its hundredth anniversary uh, next year. I'm only the fifth president in the school's history, uh, and I think I had three superintendents in the four years that I served on the San Francisco School Board. It's a very special place, uh, and uh, as you can see, the demographic changes going on in this picture. Uh, something I'm going to talk about uh, in my uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I love this job. I've been there for uh, seven years now, and uh, it's a wonderful uh, place where, again, in public higher education, uh, you'll see the impact that community colleges has uh, on the majority of kids who go to college will go to a community college. And I did my stint in Washington, D.C. Uh, that's Arnie Duncan. Uh, he's a former uh, Secretary of Education. I had the honor and privilege of serving under Secretary Duncan, or as he likes to be called, Arnie. Uh, for a, f a few years, and uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, working under the Obama administration, I still consider it to be one of the greatest privileges that I've had, and given the current state of politics today, uh, it's really elevated my importance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, so in terms of giving you the cliff notes on just what I see is from where I sit as someone who's uh, worked at different levels, I just want to share with you what I thought would be some uh, data that I think might... Uh, uh, pique your interest in terms of the contrast between China and the United States. And I was in the, in the room when uh, Arne Duncan was discussing the PISA results and uh, uh, he said to us, he said to the, uh, the country that uh, out-educates us today will out-compete us tomorrow. And, uh, uh, and the chances I had to meet with uh, President Obama and particularly J uh, Vice President Biden, uh, it was very clear that we were uh, on a competitive trying to compete with other uh, industrial countries and we knew that we were behind and we knew that we had to uh, reform some things uh, in order to try to uh, become more competitive so uh, but let me talk about a little bit about what I see in terms of uh, public education particularly you know so if you look at the numbers right you know about 75 million uh, students are now in American public schools and uh, 55 million in elementary and secondary schools about Two million of those students are in charter schools, uh, and so it's the charter school movement. How many are from are representing charter schools? Raise your hands. Yeah, so charter schools uh, uh, are still, uh, of course, a very contentious issue, a lot of debate about it, uh, but it's a relatively small number relative to the public school system. And on the flip side, and I'll talk a little bit about for-profit uh, higher education, of the 20 million students, I think there's about two million students that are currently enrolled uh, in for-profit schools. And, uh, I'll uh, uh, share with you uh, something about that as well. Uh, you know, and over 4.6 million you know, teachers and faculty, right, uh, divided amongst the K-12 and the higher ed uh, arena space. So one of the things that I see every day, and I know you see it in your schools, uh, uh, is the changing demographic of uh, our students. Uh, and this is a, a chart that talks about K-12 enrollment nationally and in California. And I think the most striking uh, contrast, again, is the decline of the white student population 
uh, and uh, the increase of particularly the Latino population. Uh, and some of those statistics are, are borne out uh, in your classrooms every day and the challenges uh, that are associated with it. Uh, and I remember when I was uh, uh, on the school board, I was uh, playing golf with Bill Rojas, who was the superintendent at the time. And I said, Bill, uh, how many uh, students, white students, do we have in San Francisco Unified School District? And he just, as a matter of fact, he said, well, about 8%. I said, 8%? That's it? And he says, yeah, you know, there's been a sort of a, uh, a flooding of, of, you know, school children in San Francisco to uh, par private schools. But I think some of that trend is a reversing a little bit, but it's still relatively low, and it's definitely not uh, on par with what the population is. It's not proportional, if you will, okay? And so some other statistics is that, you know, Latino students in the last 10 years, you know, have increased from 25 to 37 percent. Uh, at the JC where I am, that's the exact number. When I arrived in uh, 2012, uh, we had 25 percent uh, Latino students, and today we have 37 percent. So it just mirrors nationally what's happening. Uh, and then most other ethnic and racial groups uh, haven't changed that much uh, relative uh, in those times, okay? And then, you know, bachelor uh, degrees awarded to Latino students have more than doubled, you know, in the last 10 years. Uh, in other ethnicities, again, uh, you're seeing uh, the, uh, the data there. And in 2014, those who had not completed high school, black uh, Native Americans had a higher unemployment rate compared to whites. And again, again, Hispanics and adults. So there's definitely that disparity that we see uh, that is very common, and you see that in your classrooms every day, I'm sure, and some of the challenges with that. And an area I'm a little more familiar with is uh, in the community college enrollments that uh, close to 10 million students uh, are enrolled in uh, public two-year community colleges, uh, and 38% of those undergraduates attended uh, uh, public uh, uh, colleges in, in the fall of 2015, two-year colleges. So most of the students who go to college will attend a, a community college, even Asian American students, which I didn't know until I went to Washington. There's that, again, that stereotype that all the Asian students go to uh, Ivy League schools or to UC Berkeley. The majority of Asian American students who go to college will still go to a community college. And it's largely based, of course, on socioeconomic, uh, uh, your income, okay? And of all students completing a degree at a four-year college, 49% at some point attended a two-year college, you know? So you're a perfect example, you know? And it's a very uh, cost-effective way, and I think the, the quality of community college education is increasing as well. So I think my push when I was with the Obama administration is they looked at the economic model that came in during the depths of the recession, and we said, how are we going to... Uh, uh, you know, compete, and uh, President Obama and Arnie Duncan's uh, message was really the best access was through affordable quality education, and the community colleges would play that role. Uh, and uh, we put a lot of effort into pushing that, and we pushed uh, the College, America's College Promise Program, which was to provide uh, free community college for all students. And the thinking around that was 100 years ago, we talked about compulsory education. Uh, 100 years ago, high school became compulsory, and people questioned that and said, why does somebody need a high school education in order to be competitive? Today, you know, a high school diploma is, a, you know, a, a dissociate degree uh, is a two-year degree is akin to a, a high school diploma today, and that's the rationale, is that if we want to maintain our competitive edge, we're going to have to, uh, uh, you know, ramp up our, our, our edu higher education accomplishments, okay? So again, uh, I want to talk a little bit about college readiness, and that's another observation I think all of us have had that conversation about. It's uh, just really that, you know, at least 20% uh, of all first-time undergraduates require remediation and achieving the dream, which is an initiative uh, to, to increase uh, college completion. 59% of entering students uh, will require developmental math, and about a third will require developmental reading uh, who enter a community college. You know, and the readiness gap uh, between college eligibility and readiness is approximately 60% for open access colleges. So those are pretty stark statistics, you know, and it's not, in my opinion, a blame game, say that the, the, uh, uh, the K-12 teachers didn't prepare uh, the students adequately. I think you have to really look at the prior slides in terms of what type of students are coming in, right? So uh, that's an that's a ongoing a conversation that is happening at the national and I know at the state level. 
You know, so in terms of California college prep, uh, you know, in 2013, 14, about a quarter of our uh, 12th and 11th graders took at least one AP class up from, uh, you know, 15% in 2014. So I think that's a, that's a positive, right? And then the whole push around STEM, and many of you, some of you in the audience are uh, STEM instructors. We are making progress. You know, enrollment in advanced math classes has risen quite a bit uh, from, you know, before. So uh, those are on the positive side. And then the proportion of California high school graduates taking, you know, A to G requirements, as which is the requisite requirements that go into a four-year school, again, has been increasing. Uh, and that's a, that's a positive. The other area, of course, I don't have to tell you, is technology, right? Uh, technology is, again, an area that uh, is happening both at the K-12 level and uh, at the community college and fo four-year level. You know, so just look at the statistics about, you know, students now, uh, taking call, you know, distance ed classes, online classes, they're uh, increasing not incrementally but exponentially. So this is my summer enrollment at Santa Rosa Junior College. Uh, this summer was uh, we had a net increase of six percent, a three percent decline in face-to-face -face instruction, and about a nine percent increase in uh, online. And that's the only area that's growing in many community colleges today is online instruction. So that's a challenge I say to my faculty, you know, I as a president, I'm not into the pedagogy. I just have to pay the bills uh, so you can get paid, right? So it's not me pushing online to you. It's our students are voting with their feet. So we have to figure it out, you know. So that's a challenge I think many of us will face. Uh, again, uh, other uh, growth and statistics, you know, it's just growing. I mean, uh, it's amazing how fast this is happening. It's happening actually much faster than I thought. And I like to use the analogy of how many people thought that uh, drivers of cars would come so quickly, right? Uh, not, not you know, in my lifetime or not in the next year or so, they're on the streets already. And I think the online education is, again, a similar uh, a growth uh, curve. And uh, again, technology, uh, looking at uh, the, the uh, the digital divide, right? We're looking at, again, uh, those with higher levels of attainment uh, will have a ability to uh, use uh, uh, technology. And I wanna kinda uh, navigate a little bit and jump over to an area that I worked very closely with in terms of, and I'm concerned about, and I think you should be concerned about, is this whole notion of a, a for-profit education, something that uh, the current administration is promoting, uh, the, pr the past administration, which I represented, uh, we really scrutinized it. Uh, and it's just some statistics that will show you, again, that the number of students uh, enrolled in uh, for-profit higher education has grown, again, uh, quite a bit. And that uh, I don't think this is a healthy trend for a number of reasons, which we'll get into, okay. You know, the average uh, pr uh, cost for a, a two-year on uh, online degree for-profit is uh, $35,000 as opposed to 8,300 not-for-profit, right? Again, you can see the different uh, ch uh, difference in terms of cost uh, for those students. And the irony was, when I got to Washington, was we were cutting higher education, and that was driving for-profit education, because students who couldn't get into community college classes would go to for-profit schools, and they would be told, oh, you can go to school for free, the government will pay for it via loans, uh, and you, you'll be able to get education, you know? And I think I, that was very misleading and disingenuous. Oops. Again, the debt amount for those students in for-profit education averages about $33,000. And many of you probably have students who've gone through it. And I'm not saying all for-profits are bad, but I think the ones, you just have to look at the numbers, you know? And the, the, the model for for-profit institutions is that 90% on federal loans and 10% on tuition. So it's a, it's a system that's based on financing it on student debt, okay? Again, the amount of money that's spent on marketing everywhere you go, if you go to bus stops, uh, theaters, you'll see a lot of propaganda about uh, how much uh, for-profits are charging and now all the legal costs of the kind of what I call collateral damage of those students uh, who uh, in my opinion, were uh, oftentimes misled into uh, the jobs that were available afterward, just wasn't there, okay? And I can go on and on with these slides, so you, you'll probably have access to them. But I think the point to be made is that uh, 
The for-profit sector is trying to grow. It, it kind of was pushed back uh, during the Obama administration. We were very aggressive in making sure that what we call gainful employment, that if for-profit colleges wanted to advertise, that once those students got out, that they would get the type of jobs you promised them. And if you didn't hit a threshold in terms of what income those students would earn, then we could close you down. And that's all been turned back by Betsy DeVos, what she's trying to right now. And those resources that go to for-profits, they, they come out of nonprofits. They come out of public education. The student debt that you hear in the trillions of dollars largely was built and accelerated through the growth of for-profit institutions. So that's something that is much more concerning to me uh, than, than, than for mo most people. So, you know, in terms of the trends, I would say the, the, the changing student demographic trend is you seeing in the classroom. The college readiness challenge continues to be there. Um, you know, the growth of technology, both the online delivery and uh, technology in your classrooms, uh, the growth of for-profit colleges, you know. Uh, and I, I would just say that the, the Chinese uh, uh, differentiation, when I was in, uh, you know, as a college president, I go to China uh, regularly to recruit Chinese students. And I, I think Eric, who's writing a book about the experience of Chinese students in, in the United States, is a very interesting one. I, probably every two weeks I will have some agent or some college official from China uh, come visit me and checking out uh, Santa Rosa Junior College. And uh, uh, we are making a commitment to grow our international student program, not only from China, but we made a conscious decision to have students come from all over the world because we don't want to be mercenary, mercenary about it and uh, because we make a profit and we recycle those profits because international students will pay full fee uh, and they will pay out-of-state tuition. So the reason a UCLA or an SRJC is interested in it from a financial standpoint is it's a, it's a real uh, 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 money maker, revenue generator for us. And in fact, it could help subsidize the local students. Uh, but the other part of it is the opportunity for our students to have exposure to international students and the experiences they bring. So when they get into a classroom and they're talking about Syria, uh, it's about you have a Syrian student there who says, well, that's the way the press says about it, but this is the way it really is from my eyes. Uh, so I think there's a lot of upsides to uh, growing our international student program. But I know there's also been, just like anything else, when it's driven sometimes by profit, uh, that there's some exploitation. I talked to a student who... I thought she was going to Washington D. C. Washington College, and she thought she, from China, and she thought she was going to Washington D. C. There's a Washington College in New Hampshire, and she froze her butt off, and she said, "When I landed, I had no idea, you know." But they didn't tell me, you know. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, the uh, changing comparison between the Chinese system and the American system is actually we kind of try to steal from each other. We had many Chinese experts come and tell us what you know, the attributes of their system was. But many of them came to the US Department of Education saying, we know what's wrong with our system. Uh, the rote memory, the drill and kill, uh, the conformity, we know that that's not the type of skill sets that's gonna make us competitive. And uh, so they would come and ask us you know, what we we're doing uh, right and uh, what we we're doing wrong. Uh, so I think in the, at the end of the day, uh, it's really up to you, the people in this room. Uh, you are the change agents, as Clayton said, you know, and I'll close with a quote by uh, Joe Biden, uh, which is a little tricky. Uh, but Joe, <laughs> Joe said, you know, education really is about turning mirrors into windows for our students. And I like that, that visual, turning mirrors into windows. And I think that's what each and every one of you do uh, for our students and for our community. So I really want to personally thank you for uh, having one of the most challenging uh, jobs in our society. And for you, the fact that you're here today uh, is really uh, an indication of your commitment uh, to uh, you know, a better uh, educational system for all of our children. So uh, thank you very much for your time and listening. Thank you.